Welcome to Radical AI, a podcast about radical ideas, radical people, and radical stories at the intersection of ethics and artificial intelligence. As always, we are your hosts, Dylan and Jess, and we are on our third episode of our month-long series on technology and politics. In episode one, we talked about fake news and misinformation. In episode two, we talked about everything you need to know about voting and technology. And in this episode, we break down propaganda and political ads and how they impact democracy around the globe. To cover this topic, we brought two experts onto the show, Nayantara Vranganathan and Manuel Beltran. Nayantara is a lawyer and a researcher studying the politics and culture of digital technologies. At the Internet Democracy Project, she worked on applying feminist methods of research and practice to questions of data governance. Within her independent research, she is exploring how technology is remaking law and regulation in its own image. Manuel is an artist and activist. He researches and lectures on art, activism, social movements, post-digital culture, and new media. As an activist, he was involved in the Indignados movement in Spain, the Gezi Park protests in Turkey, and several forms of independent activism and cyber activism in Europe and beyond. Together, Nayantara and Manuel founded the Persuasion Lab, a project exploring new forms of political propaganda on social media. They are also both members of the Real Facebook Oversight Board, which we explore a bit in this interview. So the reason we wanted to bring both Nayantara and Manuel on was actually because I ran across a tweet from Nayantara on Twitter in the middle of September, so a little bit over a month ago. And in this tweet, she shared the Persuasion Labs project on this infrastructure that they built, which is basically this giant data set of 98 countries, plus an additional 39 countries, which they already had, of political ads and propaganda from the Facebook platform and other online platforms. And it wasn't just sharing this data, but she presented it in a way that she gave s- specific examples of ways that researchers can actually utilize this data set to battle political propaganda and to test the effectiveness of transparency or the lack thereof on these platforms. And I was hooked instantly and incredibly compelled by this story and their project, so we just had to bring them on. So without further ado, let's hear it straight from them. We are on the line today with Nayantara and Manuel of the Persuasion Lab. I'm I'm wondering if you could actually start us by talking about uh, the Persuasion Lab, how that came to be, and uh, what you all do and what you're looking at. Um, The Persuasion Lab is more of a container for the work that we've been doing around uh, examining propaganda on social media for the past year. Um, In the most recent kind of iteration of it, we have been... um, collecting political advertisements um, of Facebook and of other uh, social media companies like Snapchat, Twitter, um, as well as companies like Google, uh, to essentially have a parallel archive that is outside the stewardship of um, these platforms. And the idea is that, um, that, that, especially with Facebook, which is the platform that we started with, it was quite um, difficult to get, let's say, um, a proper hold of data that was meaningful. So for example, while there is the ad library, which is kind of their flagship tool uh, of transparency, that is still a very two-dimensional kind of um, tool uh, in the sense that the entry point into the data set is through either keyword searches or you can start with page uh, different pages and then look at the ads that they have. or so, so basically, all the parameters of data that the data set contains cannot be accessed in a more um, a, in, in a more open or three-dimensional way. So we that was just, I guess, one of the reasons why we thought it was important to have uh, a different model of access to disinformation. Right. So adding to what my colleague said, um, the lab is a very small team. We are just two. Um, we do like several things. We try to understand how new infrastructures of propaganda on social media work. 
we try to explore their intrinsically opaque dynamics. Um, so it's a lot of investigation work on, on trying to understand and make sense of how is this functioning. We collaborate with a lot of different journalists in a lot of different places, trying to then analyze and understand and obtain meaning out of the data. And we also do what we could perhaps call interventions, in which we are also trying to, to in one hand, change and shape the terms of discussion. So how are we discussing about propaganda online nowadays? Should we redefine our terminology, our understanding frameworks, and so on? And trying to create also practical interventions, such as this parallel archive that we run through this infrastructure that is on a daily basis, every 24 hours, collecting new political advertisements on social media, as an intervention to try to take away the, the, the monopoly of knowledge and control that these platforms have about um, all the data on their political advertisement. So let's maybe start at the beginning here and just unpack what political ads and propaganda even are. Are political ads the same thing as propaganda? Are they different? Do they influence each other? What do you both think? I, I think we work with, as a starting point, we work with political ads as a framework, as a classification, and as a topic of discussion only because that is kind of the way that Facebook organizes paid um, posts on their platform. So I think this is a question that comes up a lot that uh, when you guys collect data, do you like, how do you decide which is political? And then we kind of always explain that it's, um, it's, it's Facebook that does the classification. And, and, and this is kind of extremely problematic in many different ways. Um, propaganda, at least, the way that I use it is not like a derogatory term, but more of any any kind of influence that you might have, that any person might have, uh, and therefore like what are, um, let's say, how, how do these uh, algorithms, um, what is the kind of axis along which they influence, can you think of it as a unitary thing even to begin with, and so on. Um, and maybe thinking of political ads as a classification, like if you had to think of the form of that classification, the first thing that comes is, is the, the, the wording, the language of um, political ads. And I think we problematize at the lab both the political part of it as well as the advertising part of it. Um, and, and, and also like the whole kind of galaxy of terminology around the transparency framework. So for example, what does it say that um, commonly you like non paid for posts are called organic posts because it's far from organic. But um, I mean, it's far from like this, I guess, elemental natural quality of uh, reaching where it needs to, but actually it is very specifically engineered in particular ways. Um, that is an example of, I guess, the ways that, th that, that these systems of classification are extremely um, convoluted and pointing in directions that might not necessarily be useful. I think if we take the starting point of propaganda as something unavoidable in society, something that forms part of all kinds of larger forms of, of organizations of human society, the question here is how a new technology, in this case, advertisement that functions on micro-targeting and optimization, how does this change the power dynamics of the circulation, the creation, the content of these propagandas? And I think we are witnessing quite of a switch. So traditionally, we have been thinking, if I simplify it, we have been thinking about advertisement from the perspective of this is a company trying to sell me something, or this is someone trying to convince me to vote for candidate A or for candidate B. But now what we encounter in this data set of so-called political advertisements is that a lot of other actors that were not traditionally uh, creating advertisements are doing so, such as government agencies or governments 
making public announcements, a government announcing the release of a new law in the form of a paid Facebook advertisement, or in the form of lots of NGOs investing large amounts of money to, to bring emergency response towards the pandemic, or even hospitals that are just announcing health safety measures through these infrastructures of, of paid advertisement. Which this shift makes us wonder whether the terminology of still calling those advertisements is still something, let's say, precise, or if perhaps we are witnessing a shift towards, um, towards subsuming into advertisement many other forms of public discourse at large that before did not belong um, as advertisements. So this whole kind of inherited term of calling them advertisements perhaps is something to really critically revisit and whether perhaps a different term, maybe something on the lines of paid political discourse or paid public discourse or paid discourse at large, could be perhaps hinting towards a more precise um, term of, of, of speaking about this. For uh, people who maybe know almost nothing about this, um, and especially the potential harms or damage that can be done through propaganda, or political ads. Um, could you say a little bit about those potential harms and why this work is so important? I think there are a few differences in um, in the experience of propaganda or political discourse at large in the times before micro-targeting and, and nowadays. For example, we like to use this, this example of if the four of us will be sitting in a public square right now, and we will be looking at a, at a billboard, a physical billboard of paper with a political advertisement, regardless whether we like it or not, regardless whether it's uh, fake news or real information or whatever, the four of us will be able to be part of the same shared collective experience of our political reality. Thus, that will enable us to practice democracy, to practice democracy in the sense of we can have a discussion. So, this aspect of public discussion is something that we see as intrinsically necessary for, for a democracy. But now, if we imagine the scenario that instead of in the public square, the four of us walk away, and each of us is checking on their phones, our Facebook feed, and there each of us is receiving different political advertisements. In the moment that we come back to the same space and we try to have a conversation, the four of us have been subject to different perceptions of our political reality that have been specifically, intentionally targeted in different ways to each of us to cause the largest engagement or the largest likeness to be persuaded by these ads. And this in itself, I think, poses a, a very dangerous threat to the very fabric of our praxis of democracy, also in the sense of how we are able to discuss in society about politics. And if I can add to that and put it in a different way, I think there's a lot of debate around whether, you know, what is the likelihood of being persuaded by micro-targeting, to what extent is it um, a hyped up um, kind of a thing and what, to what extent is it actually useful. I think, I think regardless of whether it is effective or whether you're just getting ads for something that you already bought, um, I think what is important is to understand that the the shared semblance or like um, collectively being able to understand what the information environment is like at any particular point in time has become really difficult even with an intentional mind to do so. Could you both maybe give us a lens as to how this political, uh, you know, micro targeting on platforms online is changing the public discourse and democracy globally. What have you both experienced? I think I, I, I don't know. I would like to situate myself, let me say, um, very much in India. And so I don't know about like the vast uh, expanse of the rest of the world, but I can like we did look at um, elections in India in 2019 
and that's where we kind of started working on um, AdWatch and eventually Persuasion Lab. So what we saw was um, a lot of, like what we were able to see in the data sets, in the political ads data sets, let's say, was very clearly um, different well-produced ads being dubbed in different languages according to the different states. Like very typical, obvious, um, unsurprising kind of things. But what we found was a deep uh, sense of dissatisfaction with the information that we had in the data set. Because what the data set shows is actually the aftermath of targeting. So for example, where you have the demographic information, that is how many men or women were targeted, uh, how many people in these different age ranges were targeted. All of these kinds of information, what it is telling us is what happened in the aftermath of an advertiser buying ads, Facebook then deciding according to its own optimization, targeting, whatnot, uh, delivering it to particular people, and then the, the demographic profiles and region profiles of these people. So let's say the intention of the advertisers or the kinds of information used by Facebook in delivering these ads, all of this is still extremely undisclosed. So I think from the beginning, what the political ads data shows points you in the direction of content of the ads, as well as some of the more traditional ways of understanding targeting. So I guess with television and so on, I think it was still fair to understand targeting on the basis of uh, region or, or, you know, like you have different language ads in different places, or for example, uh, you would place a particular kind of ad if it was a children's show or if it was a late night show, that kind of a thing. But the same kinds of uh, devices or market segments are being used in presenting political ads data. Whereas the information that advertisers are uh, providing, the intentions of advertisers or the way that the platform itself um, delivers ads is far more sophisticated. And by Facebook's own admission, for example, there's like close to 2 million data points that are used in deciding which advertisement goes to whom. So I guess that was the that was the main takeaway, at least for me, from the Indian elections, that we were seeing like all of this money going into advertising and in the absence of good electoral finance transparency in the country in any case, Facebook was not helping make uh, any difference either Show, throwing light on what was happening with the political parties or within its own platform. There were in the beginning we started finding a lot of problems. Um, let's say we found a lot of violations of electoral law in India, but we experience the lack of mechanisms for the, in this case, the Electoral Commission of India, to bring that into accountability to be able to even understand the data that we were providing. So. As much as we have regulations put in place across the world for regulation of political ads in radio, in TV, or even in so-called electronic media, there is very little to nothing, depending on the place, when it comes to, to online advertisements. And when it comes to micro-targeted advertisements, it's, it's even closer to zero. But I think in general, we are seeing a discourse So regarding the question of what is the influence of social media in democracy? This question is very much completely kidnapped to be a majoritarily US-centric conversation about what is the role of, um, of Facebook with foreign influence, with bots, with networks of harassment, or, or you name it. But those are problems that have been occurring in the rest of the world through the whole year are problems that are happening right now with elections such as in Bihar or Myanmar that are happening in parallel now with the US elections that is not receiving like a 1% of the attention in terms of public discourse nor in terms of actions. 
And I think here it comes to a question of what kind of governance model do we want to have in, in a platform? First of all, whether we want to have a platform like this or not, but as we have it as an emergency response, what kind of governance model we can have? And for example, with a lot of the discussion on nationalizing Facebook, what will be the role of governance on Facebook being a US company towards the elections in Myanmar or towards the elections in Cuba? How will that operate with countries that geopolitically the United States is at odds? And I think we can observe like the extension of, of the political, of the, the geopolitical uh, influence of the United States. Mm. It's been materialized, for example, in their takedowns of networks when they are catching up and announcing takedowns of Russian bots or Iranian bots or North Korean influence campaign or Cuban bots. It tends to be with countries that very much is resonating with US uh, foreign policy. So it could be even more problematic than it's now to, to arrive on, on a scenario in which US lawmakers can help Facebook, let's say, to account to be a patriotic company that protects the United States interest, while it's, it's operating, it has much more many users outside of the United States. It has influence in much more many elections in the rest of the world than in the United States. But those are, unfortunately, um, not the terms of, of the discussion that is ongoing now. I was wondering if we could talk a bit about uh, oversight in general and oversight on Facebook and Facebook's ads uh, particularly. Um, so Facebook has its own oversight board, uh, but then there was this new group that came about that you both are involved with called the Real Facebook Oversight Board. Um, and I was wondering if you both would be willing to talk about why that came to be um, and what uh, what its what its function is. Yes, so... Facebook launched this initiative of um, a Facebook oversight board that it's supposed to be an, an independent organization that seeks to um, to oversee some of the parts of Facebook. But from its very inception, it's a body that, first of all, it's Facebook's own initiative. It's paid with Facebook's money. Um, the, the reach of what they can do is extremely limited to be about content moderation. And uh, we have seen this happening with other governments with totalitarian um, tendencies in which they create fake judiciary bodies or oversight boards to have a kind of certain sense of accountability in this regime while depriving it from any kind of meaningful agency power and so on. So we think that very much, or, or I think, that Facebook's own oversight board is very much a tool to legitimize, to make acceptable and to normalize the status quo of how this company operates, rather than to bring any at all meaningful change to how the platform works, while also distracting the attention towards saying, no, we already have a process, you know, to follow with complaints and so on through this board. Okay, so about a month ago, we released together with 23 other um, civil rights leaders, activists, scholars, and general critics that have been for a long time um, problematizing the, this platform, this real Facebook oversight board, which you can see as a campaign to try to put into the spotlight the problematics of Facebook oversight board, and also having a very pragmatic, practical, and, and urgent goal of the campaign that is being performed as an emergency response to the situation in the United States to try to influence, to, to let's say, to lesser the degrees of harms that this platform will uh, is provoking now in the run-up to the election, I and mean, in the run-up and in what might happen after the election. While we're on the topic of Facebook here and um, using it as a, a bit of a, an infamous example, but of course, Facebook is, is symbolic of many other social media platforms out there that are struggling with political ads and propaganda right now. I want to talk a little bit about transparency 
and what its role is in all of this, because um, it seems like there's a big problem with transparency when it comes to knowing what's even classified as a political ad, knowing, uh, you know, who is getting what political ads over what other political ads. So what what is the role of transparency or the lack thereof in all of this? I think transparency has been such a potent promise in response to so many things, in response to how hate speech policy is uh, operationalized, in response to how political ads operates and so on. Um, but unfortunately, since Facebook itself has, like it's a self-regulatory mechanism where it has come up with the transparency framework, um, it has ended up kind of entirely subverting the actual um, potent promise that it was. Uh, by, on the one hand, the data that is released by Facebook and the other platforms and all other platforms that, for example, have what they call political ads, there is a certain ceiling that has emerged, which, um, where, so for example, Twitter uh, bans political ads. Facebook gives a certain level of impunity or like certain privilege to political speech where uh, they do not fact check political speech. Um, so, so regardless of what your approach is, whether you ban it, whether you give it special privileges, all of them agree that political ads is a category um, and that category and its visibilization through political ads transparency kind of hides the entire iceberg of um, of advertisements that do not fall under the realm of political ads. And even within this data set, if you start to look beyond this big, heavy word of transparency and then to, to start to look into what are the different parameters that are, um, that are made uh, known, it is extremely limited and mostly just what the advertisers are in any case kind of submitting. Mm, you know, like not, not that, targeting intent, but for example, like what is the visual of the ad or what is the title that comes with it? What is the caption that comes with it? These are some of the kinds of parameters that are visibilized. Um, entirely unsatisfactory. But if you look at also the language in which a lot of these parameters are described, one begins to think that, um, one begins to think that it is entirely in service of platforms' business models, the way that these frameworks have come to be. So for example, um, what is an ad? The question of what is an ad, is it just the visual? If there is some you know, JSON targeting data, if there's line, lines of code that come along with it, is that part of what one imagines as an ad? Or if we were to look, or, or if what is important is the impact of Facebook's advertising network, then we're also looking at people that are receiving ads. And the reason why I receive a particular ad would be entirely different from the reason why you receive the same ad. Mine could be because, uh, you know, I'm tagged as someone under 30 in Bangalore and yours could be because you go to a particular college. Um, and, and so do we look at the ads that we both have received as the same or is there value in looking at that as two separate cases of advertising? So what that is termed as, like these two separate cases, is termed as impressions. So one ad has 100 million impressions is how it is presented. But what if we were to think of that as here is 100 million ads? That kind of visibilizes the profiling behind this infrastructure, the targeting, the unique ways of targeting for each individual, whether it works or not, that, but that there is like 1,000 million ways in which one particular ad moves. Um, and, and, and so to get back to the question, I, I am, what I'm trying to say is that transparency um, is architected by the language that favors platforms by the aesthetics of dashboards and APIs and all of these like quantitative kind of um, affective tools that make you feel like, ooh, data, 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 so much stuff to like, here's a visualization and there's a 
ticker and like here's graphs and all of that. So this uh, aesthetics, there's language, there's processes and mechanisms, all of which make it way, make their way also into laws and, um, and, and governance models. So the framework evolved by marketing departments of the biggest advertising company, it go, becomes what is also the way that uh, we want to kind of change things within laws. Um, and, and so let's say, like, I think it's not just even the case for social media, even if you look at government initiatives of uh, transparency, there's a lot of APIs, there's a lot of like dashboards and buzzwords and whatnot, but I think it's part of a larger kind of promise and how that is being delivered through a particular aesthetic. One thing I really appreciate about uh, the Persuasion Lab is that you're doing a lot of uh, advocacy, you're doing this work uh, analyzing ads, and then you're also bringing art into it. And I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the exhibitions that you've put on um, and the role that you see art playing in the work that you do. I think that very much relates with what Nayantara just explained about, about language, perhaps. But I think we are trying to make sense of extremely complex and extremely opaque infrastructures um, in which it's, it's really difficult, I think, for people to imagine that an ad is not an ad or, you know, to kind of question these foundations of our beliefs on, on what we think about certain technologies. And we found that in this case of the Persuasion Lab, it was... Um, Let's say it was a framework that worked for us to first of all establish ourselves as a lab that is also running a lot of projects in an artistic context. So our infrastructure for collection and liberation of advertisements was first deployed in an, in an art exhibition in Austria. And this is what now has a life of its own online and, and people can, can download the data um, just from the web. But in the exhibitions, we try to also let's say, create a situation, create the conditions in which a different kind of discussion can happen, in which we can also imagine a space of questioning these platforms outside of the realms and the terms in which these companies normally want to engage in, in criticism. Um, and, and also to, as Nayantara pointed out, with all of these aesthetics of dashboards, of APIs, of transparency that these companies are selling, our octopus that you can see in, in our exhibitions is this the physical representation of the of the first infrastructure. It was also, you could say, an aesthetic intervention trying to reveal how difficult it was to collect this data. You know, that is not something that you can perhaps experience in the dashboards in, in our websites, but you can perhaps experience in a different way when, when you are coming to this situation. Of, of an exhibition. So something that uh, both Dylan and I find very interesting about the Persuasion Lab and some of the language that both of you have been using in this interview is the word liberation. So I'm curious what both of you uh, mean when you say the word to liberate and what that means in the context of uh, political propaganda online. That's a fantastic question. Um, as, as you were asking about the U.S. before, um, I have one example that I, I like to, to compare the work that we are doing with. Um, in the United States, there is something called the, the Pather system. So in order to, to access the law in the system, you, you could access the, the, the documents, the papers of the law in a digital form, which you needed to pay every time you were uh, downloading this data. And of course, that was extremely problematic when, when you think in a, in, a, in a democracy in which you have to pay to access the law, you enter into a lot of problematics of who can access these documents, you can't, or maybe I'm just a student that wants to inform myself, you know, about how the law works, or I'm just a curious citizen, you know, something that every citizen in a democracy should have access to. I think I compare the importance of having not transparency data as we understand it now, but real transparency data on how propaganda, how political propaganda is circulating online. That is something that 
we do not yet, I think, as a whole in society understand that we should submit to a kind of equal level of importance of having this as something that belongs in the public domain. Facebook has created, for example, a few initiatives in which they gave some researchers access to a bit of the data, not all of it. I think that will be a still extremely problematic in which this transparency data is only available to a few. Or also if this data is only available to a technically skilled few that can access it through their complex system of verification APIs and so on. Thus it came our idea to, okay, what if we liberate all of this data in, in the form of an archive? It is something that, let's say, by the optics, Facebook has a difficult time to censor, but just a few days ago, um, the, the New York Ads Observatory has received a cease and desist letter to stop the initiative of collection of ads as well. Um, and I think this just redoubles our commitment to the effort of liberating this as not just something that we distribute publicly, but something that is being taken away from the public, something which intentionally is made difficult to access, which intentionally does not allow for systematic collection of it. So in, in the moment in which there are so many barriers, I think it's not only a question of distributing this freely, but really liberating it from the prison of Facebook. And I think it's also about the integrity of the data and whether um, it's the teeth that it has, whether that changes once it is out of um, Facebook's uh, systems. So, so an API, what it allows you to do is like fashion a particular kind of query that is specific, that retrieves information from their system and kind of presents it to you. But what we do is kind of liberate it also from that relationship of, of putting your hand in and picking up a particular thing um, to kind of look at it from all sides, understand it better as, as an object. And, um, and yes, I think also there is sometimes uh, when people are curious about uh, the project, they also, want, when they want to work with the data, they kind of think of the data set also as a finished or a complete thing. Um, whereas that is also, it's never a God's eye view of political advertisement, but always kind of carries a particular vantage point of the time of collection of the particular query that we had to input. I mean, we, we try to do a maximal kind of query so that we get as much information out as possible and kind of archive it. But uh, the idea is that even with all of these imperfections, Mm, and even with like the fact that ultimately this is data that Facebook releases, so I imagine there is like many degrees of um, uh, uh, of safekeeping their assets already that happens uh, before the, the data is released. But even then, I think there have been cases of disappearing ads from the library, things like that. And I think the the any teeth that this data could have is sharpened once it's outside the control of Facebook. So I think liberation is towards that idea of um, also keenly understanding that sure, right now Facebook is making this data known, but it is still very much on its own terms, under its own control. Exactly. And, and I think it's also not just a way for other people to access the data and study it and see the content, but also hopefully an intervention to hold the archive of Facebook to accountability, as we have mapped before the, the, latest, um, the latest elections in the United Kingdom. Thousands of advertisements disappeared from Facebook at library. In that moment, we did not have our infrastructure put into place. But in that moment, we could compare, okay, like, did the data of Facebook change from what they were giving yesterday, what they give today? So as just to put the emphasis of, yes, it's not only just about the content, but also to try to problematize the whole frame, the whole framework in itself by by having this separate archive. As we move towards closing the interview, uh, I'm wondering if you have any advice for 
users of these systems. So users of Facebook who are seeing ads um, is what what can we do? <laughs> what can people do or what should people do um, about these ads that they're seeing on a daily basis? And then any other closing thoughts that you might have that you want to share? Right. So as we have been discussing already for quite a while in the conversation, um, the language, the, the terms that we use to discuss about these problematics, our whole concept of these platforms, even the concept of what is our role? What is my role as a citizen of this platform? Am I a user? Oh, I have no power as a user. Can I organize with others? And I think a lot of the problems that we have been facing, not just with political propagandas online only, but in the general with the open source movement and with recycling, with the climate and many other things, is that a lot of the responsibility has been put into the individual. You know, Coca-Cola is making advertisements asking me to recycle their bottles while they are polluting so much more. And I think the, the current status quo when it comes to political organization around technology starts from an extremely precarious situation in which we are seeing ourselves as individual users of these platforms in which what you can do as an individual gets narrowed down to, oh, you should be using Jitsi instead of Zoom, or you should be using Brave instead of Google Chrome. You know, this, this kind of question of individual choices. While at the end of the day, it's going to be a very few people who has the privilege, and it's really about the privilege to, to use those platforms from the basis of they have a computer powerful enough to run it, or they have the time to learn about this, or they have the expertise, or whether their networks are in another platform and so on. While Facebook has arrived to a point in which so many people depend on this platform, like the whole life depends on this platform, to, to be in touch with their family members, to perform their work, to, to study with Facebook groups, the level of dependency of the platform has reached to a point in which I don't see it as a viable political proposal to say we all delete our Facebook accounts because we will be very few and it will be even unfair to them put the blame on the ones who are still in this platform when they are victims as well. Um, so I think maybe one of the problems is that we do not really, we are not yet able to properly imagine how we would like to organize our technologies in society. like. I see a proportion of 99% of criticism towards Facebook, a 1% of discourse about alternatives of how could we differently organize all of these problematics. Um, and maybe I come back to art again in, in, in previous projects with the Institute of Human Obsolescence and others. We were trying to work with the idea of what if instead of seeing ourselves as individual users of a platform, we will see ourselves as workers of this platform. So let's say if the data that we are producing for these platforms is so intrinsically crucial, maybe we are performing work for them. And what kind of forms of political organization could emerge from a different understanding of what is our relationship with these companies? What kind of different um, political proposal could we articulate if we claim that an advertisement is not just an advertisement, but it's something different? So I think this comes really to, to, to concepts and how do, do we see ourselves, how do we imagine ourselves, how do we mind these companies. And I think in our work we are trying to, to try to question all of those aspects. And for those who are looking to question, to reimagine, and to liberate themselves, if they want to look more at both of your work and the work of the Persuasion Lab, where's the best place for them to go? We're trying to be better at um, organizing <laughs> our website to be a good repository of what we do. So I think that is kind of a good place to begin. I just want to thank uh, Jess and Dylan for giving us a bit of advertisement space uh, within uh, this podcast about advertisement. So yes, the, the, the perfect place to start with will be at dot watch. That is our website. Um, you will find plenty of resources to get yourself lost there from text to understand more about us, uh, interfaces in which you can browse by country, you can browse by themes such as the 
It can bring advertisements that speak about the climate crisis or advertisements about the pandemic of COVID-19. You can, of course, download all the data sets that we liberate every 24 hours. And we have also an activity section in which you can see different investigations that we have published, different reports with the media, listings of all of our exhibitions, and, and all of that is there. And we'll be transparent and promise that this is not a political advertisement, but we just really love the work that's going on here. So thank you so much, Manuel and Nayantara, for coming on the show today. So just propaganda in the age of information. There is just so much going on with this conversation, and I'm not entirely sure uh, where to begin, but I'm brought back to um, something that Manuel brought up in the interview where it was the difference between this uh, image of a billboard that, you know, multiple people, all four of us um, are looking at and we're all seeing the same thing versus propaganda now, say in a Facebook ad where everything is curated on an individual micro basis. And it's kind of terrifying to me when I think about it. Um, and I love what uh, the Persuasion Lab is doing, especially using art as resistance and, and all of this. But it's um, <clears throat> it's just a lot to, to think about how propaganda has changed so much in such a relatively short amount of time, like even thinking back to like the 70s and 80s to today and uh, how we don't even necessarily know what to call, like to, when to call propaganda propaganda, when to call it just political ads um, and how to like think about all of this in the first place, especially in terms of ethics. Yeah, I really actually appreciated that Manuel uh, gave the the new terminology that we should be calling political ads, which is paid public discourse. I've never heard of that before, and that really stood out to me. Uh, and I think the other thing I'm sitting with right now that's something I'm actually kind of struggling with a little bit. I feel like the bubble was popped for me in this conversation, I feel like I've been sitting in this like US centric bubble because of this election that's going on. And I have not been paying any attention to what's going on globally. And I feel weird about it because I genuinely did not know that Myanmar and Cuba were having elections right now because I am so enveloped in this bubble that, I mean, I'm definitely to blame for the majority of it, but I'm wondering also if part of that has to do with the fact that the only things that I see online are political ads and propaganda about the U.S. election. And so I'm wondering if there are other people that are feeling like they're existing in this bubble that was created for us and based off of inferences that are made about us that we didn't actually ask to be in in the first place. Absolutely. And it's tied to uh, the platforms that we're using. It's, it's tied to Facebook. Something that really stood out to me was when our guests today were talking about um, where Facebook is based, right? And the fact that it's based in the U.S. and can be tied to, you know, U.S. Uh, lawmakers so, so easily now and also possibly in the future and how much that impacts how information is shared to the point where we might not even know like who is creating or curating or whether what information is real or right or whatever because it's still in this uh, somehow still really nationalistic lens because of where that company was founded and where it's based and now it's impacting people all over the world to the point and i think manuel again was making this point about how people are dependent on it now and, and i've seen that firsthand in, in traveling and it's um it's true. I mean, it's a platform, maybe even a luxury for some folks in the world. And for other folks, it's like how they find jobs, how they find goods, how they get education. Like Facebook has a lot of utility that isn't just all negative or all political or all whatever. And yet the politics are so wrapped up into everything. And so is the economics and capitalism and, and, and all of that. And again, that's what makes me feel so like overwhelmed by all of it. Because I, I, as a user, it's why I asked that question at the end. I feel so out of control in in this. Yeah, I mean, because Facebook doesn't just have utility, it, it has power, right? Like the people who create 
Facebook and design Facebook and code Facebook and work for Facebook have a ton of power over the entire world and what they choose to even categorize as political versus not political in different countries, which is like crazy to me that that's different depending on like the countries that, you know, ads are being displayed in. That is super powerful. And that's also super dangerous if that power isn't wielded well. So I, I'm sitting with a lot of discomfort in this conversation. I'm trying not to be a face Facebook hater, but I'm just feeling really weird towards the company right now after this conversation. <laughs> yeah, it's um, <clears throat> it's it's kind of wild to think about their answer. And this was towards the beginning of the interview when uh, I think we had asked them how they determine, you know, what ads uh, for the work that they're doing, what ads they qualify as political. And they said, no, it's actually Facebook that's doing that qualification. And then they're interacting with those ads that Facebook has said, what is political or not. And like you're saying, like categorization is an act of power. And uh, that's exactly what's happening. So it's not necessarily to say there's, there's a bunch of, you know, poor intentioned or ill intentioned people at Facebook who are trying to do evil or wield power in ways that are like abusive uh, explicitly. But it is to say that all of those decisions about what gets seen, what doesn't get seen, who gets to see what, even in the algorithm, there are real consequences to how all of that unfolds. And I think this is just so important that there is this other group uh, that have named themselves, you know, the uh, real Facebook oversight board. Um, I hope I got <laughs> the order of those names <laughs> right. Um, but I, it's so important that those people exist. And <clears throat> it's really wonderful that, the you know, and maybe, maybe we're biased because we have had some of those people on the show before. Um, so like Ruha Benjamin's part of that. Um, Sophia Noble is someone else who we've been in conversation with, even though um, we haven't had her on the, on the show as an um, individual guest. But um, I think it's really important that the people who are looking at these practices for companies like this are not just the people that are uh, chosen by the company itself. Yeah, I mean, that's how I feel like oversight boards should be in general, right? Like, if you make an internal oversight board, I feel like that's a juxtaposition. <laughs> like, who? how can you provide oversight from the inside when you still have all the biases of the people who work on the inside and you still have, you know, if, for example, Facebook, you still have Facebook's best interests at heart. Like, oversight should be people who have no vested interest who are willing and needing to shoot straight with the people who are doing harm. And that's why I, I just absolutely love what the real Facebook oversight board is doing. I think um, it's a great project, a great start, and hopefully it'll help promote greater transparency from not just Facebook, but, you know, all social media companies, especially when it comes to politics. Yeah. It makes me just as a quick tangent, it makes me think about like um, the IRB in our academic world, which stands for the institutional review board. Is it internal review board? Oh, we were arguing about this the other day, and now I'm second guessing myself. It's I want to say it's institutional. Either way, it's within like that institution, which is supposed to be uh, regulating itself to some degree. And I'm like, that, that there seem to be some issues with that. Like, how did that get to be the gold standard? Maybe there's a great answer to that question. I don't know, um, but uh, it does seem like if a group is regulating itself without any sort of external certification or uh, anything like that, then there's at least some gaps uh, for either misuse or outright harm. Because if I was an entity, as an entity, as an individual, right? I'm like, I'm not, I don't always see all the gaps in my own, you know, ethical decision-making. Sometimes I need people to call me out because they see things in a different way, maybe in a more nuanced or holistic way. Yeah, and so maybe, uh, I mean, I'll internally oversee this episode uh, and say that we are out of time for today. <laughs> and we have talked long enough about political ads and propaganda, but be sure to check out the show notes to get all the links and information that you need to download that data set from Manuel and Nayantara because it is amazing. And especially if you're a researcher in this space, we would highly recommend you go and check them out. For more information on today's show, please visit the episode page at RadicalAI.org. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. Catch our new episodes every week on Wednesdays. 
Join our conversation on Twitter at Radical AI Pod. And before we say our closing line, just a note, if you are listening to this on the day it comes out or a few days after that, so that would be Wednesday, October 28th, please note that our internship uh, application process is closing on November 1st. So if you know someone who would be a great fit for that, please send our information uh, their way and we'll add that to the show notes as well. And just in case you are more of a visual or sorry, auditory learner than a visual learner, that is a radicalaipod.org backslash internship. It's not right. It's just radicalai.org. Did I say the wrong thing? You said radicalaipod.org. Oh, wow. It's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> That's our Twitter. So again, (laughs) now that you're thoroughly confused, for the general episode page and other things to do with us, you can go to RadicalAI.org. If you want information on the internship, you can go to RadicalAI.org backslash internship. And if you're interested in following us on Twitter, you can find us at RadicalAIPod. Ah, that's that's, that's yeah, how you got. That's important. Yeah, confused mm-hmm. in that. Yeah. Thank you. No, I, I was confused. Yeah, too. reach out, talk to us, um, <laughs> tell us how we confuse you. <laughs> and and as, always, as always, stay, stay radical. radical. <laughs> the solid work. That was, that was good. We really, we, we, uh, we were in sync on that one. Also, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think fiery. Fire? No, it's all synapses are firing. I've never heard that expression. We have no synapses firing right now. Synapses firing This is propaganda. This is yeah. Don't listen to this propaganda. Yeah, I'm gonna this is... cut this. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're...